This is Starburst Storefront. After an insanely successful first day, the founders of Cousin Maine Lobster knew they had a cult classic on their hands. But what they didn't know was that some of those early customers were actually Shark Tank producers. Not once, but twice. The producers tried to convince the two founders into going on the show, but every time they turned it down. And then eventually, Cousins Maine Lobster appeared on season four of Shark Tank. Since closing a deal with Barbara Cochran, they have been able to expand into over 50 trucks and locations across 24 states. In today's episode, we chat with Saban, the co-founder of Cousins Maine Lobster, about how this crazy journey all started over a round of drinks, how the relationship with Barbara has evolved over the years, and the beauty that comes with introducing people to lobster for the very first time. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Sabin from Cousins Maine Lobster. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. What made you guys want to start the company? <sighs> Take me back to the beginning. Alcohol. Alcohol. Lots of it. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, we were... Um, you're in Maine. You're sad. No, we you're were, cold. We were here. Oh, you're in So I, was, okay. um, I lived out here. Okay. And uh, I was flirting with acting and flirting with real estate. I sold real estate. And my baby cousin, Jimmy, came out to visit a, visit a girl. He called me. I said, man, you're out here? We, we got to hang out. So I took him out to Katana. You know, this is like, what was it, 12 years now? 12 years ago. And we got hammered. And we were sitting out there, and, you know, we're just drink after drink after drink. And we realized kind of throughout the night how much we missed each other. You know, we grew up together, and we hadn't seen each other in years, one of those things. And my grandfather had just passed away. We were talking about family and life and, you know, food and all that kind of stuff. And we both were doing kind of entrepreneurial-based jobs. He sold medical devices, okay. and I sold real estate. Yeah. So um, we were like, shit, man, we should do something together, you know? Like, what would, you know, that, yeah, you know, yeah, well, you know, drink, 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 yeah, you know. And yeah. then we're like, what would we do? This is a great story. And then it was like, man, what about lobster? Fuck yeah, lobster. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Let's do it. You know, because that's what we grew up with in Maine. When you grow up where, where we're from, it's it's kind of always there. It's accessible. Whether totally. It's Thanksgiving or uh, a summer barbecue, someone has lobster. Yeah. So like we, we came up with it that night. And then the, the next day he flew home. I thought it was a terrible idea. I was, we were hungover, like, you know, nothing sounds as good when you're drunk. Right. And then he called like two weeks later and then he just kept sending Excel sheet after Excel sheet. And he's like, what if we do this? What if we do this? We only need to sell 37 a day to break even. Like lobster rolls. Lobster rolls. Wow. And so um, I eventually said yes, because he was so annoying. He just wouldn't leave me alone. I was like, this guy's persistent. He played uh, D1 hockey. He's a competitor. So I was like, he's not going to let this fail. Yeah. So we agreed, like I was going to be on the West Coast. I was going to oversee the truck. He was going to ship the product. Hopefully we break even. That was, okay. a, that was then, the goal. The goal was to break even. How quickly thereafter did you end up buying a truck? Probably like six months later. Okay. Yeah. So we worked on the idea and, you know, we leisurely it was there was no urgency and so. what does the truck need exactly is it just like refrigeration like it, it depends prep? on it depends on what you're doing but for us it was refrigeration a couple fryers a flat top grill okay. some soup wells pretty yeah. easy and and again we knowing now what we have as opposed to what that was it was you know our trucks now are ridiculous and so then your first step is you decide to do it you, you have a menu it's simple i imagine easy items we're in a one bedroom here on king's road in west hollywood okay we're in my kitchen yeah we're literally on my at my stovetop cooking up rolls, being like, yeah, yeah, you like this one? All right, cool. This is the one, this is what we'll do. <laughs> yeah, you want to do this one? No, I don't like that. All right, cool. Let's do that. So, so we had like seven items. Menu creation done. We literally had no idea what we were doing. The, we didn't tell anyone we were doing it. So we waited about a year before we told anyone. What year is this, by the way? This is 20, uh, well, 2011. We worked on okay. it. We launched in April 2012. So almost like pre, definitely pre-Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah, Twitter was kind of around. Early social yeah, days. Early, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we just, you know, we didn't tell our families. We didn't want to have any like naysayers. We didn't want to have any negativity wow. because, you know, like so you're you, protecting when, it, you're protecting more, it. Your not mentals. from like, not from a like, oh, you're going to steal my idea, but more from like a, just a, you know, people hate on things and you suddenly listen to it. Yeah. You know, so if I, if I told you I was going to serve lobster off a food truck, you might be like, oh, and yeah. I'd be like, oh yeah. I might ask you more questions, doubt, and I, insist. And then I might be like, shit, maybe it's not that good of an idea. Yeah. Maybe you I fucked this up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we didn't do that. That's actually smart. You protected your mindset there. Yeah. yeah. We, we ended up opening. Uh, I put out a tweet, you know, we probably had like, I don't know, 27 Twitter followers at the time, but it was a photo of me, Jimmy, and my grandfather on the rocks in Maine. I said, if you want to get fresh Maine lobster, come here tonight. And Urban Daddy, for some inexplicable reason, picked it up. We didn't have PR. I didn't even know what PR was at the time. And uh, they picked it up, blasted it out, said, if you guys want lobster in LA, go see these cousins. They're from Maine. 
And then uh, where did well, you do it? Where did you, where was your we first spot? We were in uh, the Portuguese food hall, um, you know, in South Bay, just some random location. Yeah. And again, we're hoping to do like 30, 40 rolls. We right. opened the window and there was a line of like 60, 70 people. And I knew literally at that moment, I, was, I turned to him, I was like, yeah, this is going to be big. Like, this is going to be big. And I, I was like, you can't leave. Because he was supposed to go back to Boston. Yeah. I was like, you can't leave. You can't go. Shit. And you sold out, I imagine. We sold out. We were, I mean, we made like six grand in cash, six grand in sales. Yeah. We came home that night to my, my one bedroom. We're on the coffee table counting cash. We're like, what the, what just happened? You know, like this is, what the, what the fuck? That's amazing. And then we got an email from Shark Tank that night and they reach out to about 20 entrepreneurs every year. That's crazy. And they're like, hey, would you ever consider going on the show? So a tweet, Urban Daddy, and then boom. And then one of those Shark Tank. And they're like, we like the idea. We think you guys would be great. Two months later, we're on Shark Tank, partnering with Barbara Corcoran. Fucking, I mean, like insane. That's unbelievable. Okay, so when you were offered, so at this point, you're almost like, you didn't tell anybody you're saying, right? You protected the idea a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have success the first day. While you're in the transition of like applying to Shark Tank, are you starting to tell people now? Or are you like, all right, we tell have- Tell people about what, Shark Like Tank? your friends, no, no, just about Oh about yeah, the no, business. we told them about a week before we opened. Okay. We told everyone before we opened. And was yeah. the hard part figuring out the sourcing or did you guys have that like nailed no, in? No, everything was hard. We had no idea what we were doing, everything. I mean, and again, it wasn't really hard. It was more just like we were winging it, you know, knowing what we know now. Yeah. But we were going off of like our gut for everything. You know, now if, if I was to give you advice You're on how to start a business, I would know. Oh, bro, we didn't, we knew nothing yeah. about anything. That's, I, I think that's the secret, honestly. Like when I think about everything I'm doing, I'm definitely in over my skis all the time. Yeah. But somehow it's like there's control in that. And then you figure out like that's the only way to do it, actually. You can't, you have to be a little delusional. You can't, you're not going to have it figured out. No. If you play logic, you, you won't do it. It's not logical to do these ventures. Correct. But then it's like addicting. Then you're like, oh, that's dope. Yeah. And then once people get a little bit of taste of that success yeah. or like, oh shit, we can do this. Yeah. Like I manifested that thing. Wait a second. We actually can, you know, you can actually do oh. Then it's like gasoline on a fire for people like us, yeah. right? For you. 100%. So you go and you get in over your skis, but then you do something and you do it well, you mess up and you still do it well. Yeah. And you're like, wait a second, I can do that. And then that's like, goodbye. I just watched the movie Air and on it, they give like the tenants of Nike. And yeah. the, I think number six or something was like, um, results are perfect. The process will never be perfect. Mm -hmm. Just keep moving. Something like that. And I was like, that's exactly it. Correct. That's exactly the thing. The process always sucks. When you guys were going to go on Shark Tank. Did you, did you realize how big the show was? No, I no. didn't even know what, sh what the show, I didn't even never heard. Cause of it's it. you're two months into this entrepreneurship journey. So it's and early. It's, it's also 2012. So Shark Tank was in its, I think we were on season four, I think. So they were only on three seasons. Yeah. They weren't that big. I don't really watch reality TV. I watch sports. Yeah. So I had no idea. Jimmy knew. So did you guys rehearse a bunch? Were you, oh, or were you not nervous at all? Cause yeah, you didn't no, really know. Yeah. No, we rehearsed. That's the one thing we did the best. We, yeah. we watched like 50 episodes we had index cards and we wrote down questions because we realized the sharks at that time, especially all said the same questions. Okay. So Damon would say this and Barbara would say this and Mark would say this. So we just flipped on the other side and we just wrote our answers and then we quiz each other in my, again, in my one bedroom. So I'd stand up and I'd pretend to be Kevin O'Leary and I'd say, Hey, you know, you know, I don't like the valuation or it'd be Damon and it would Mark about the sourcing or whatever. Yeah. And so we, we just grilled them. We'd go on runs in the neighborhood. We'd get our heart rate up and we'd be answering them. We'd stand in the mirror. He'd answer questions while I'm trying to mess with them. And we'd just do everything oh we could to God. kind of throw each other off. And, and I'd done acting in New York City. And so I kind of like had brought some things in to try and mess with Jimmy, especially. Sure, sure. So when the lights came on, we weren't scared. That's and, so and smart. Lo and behold. So you're like creating stressful environments. So yeah, you're I was like, yeah. I'd take the hairdryer out and strangle myself in front of him in the mirror and do all kinds of weird shit. Yeah. And he'd be sitting there continuing with his pitch continuing with this pitch yeah. and we did well we wanted to represent state of maine well we wanted to um you know we didn't want to come off as like cocky or egotistical that was like the biggest thing yeah. and we wanted to deal we wanted to deal with barbara you wanted to deal with barbara yeah. the whole time yeah we want to deal with barbara and so you go and ask him for fifty-five thousand for mm -hmm. what 10 percent 15 15 percent no we asked for five percent we settled for like 15 yeah okay i just love it how they're all asking you how you got to that valuation and, and I'm like, yeah. I'm watching, I'm like, these guys don't, it's so early. It's so, it's too, you know, so we were just doing the math. We'd done 150,000 in sales for the first two months. So we're like, oh, it's probably a million dollar business. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, and. And one hi truck, it scales quickly. Yeah. yeah. And, and in hindsight, it's a steal, right? Because. Totally. <laughs> like it's. Why do you think Barbara liked you? Why do you, what was it about you guys that, cause she seemed like she just really, there was something about her that connected with you guys personally. Yeah. 
I think she likes people that I think she she didn't think we were bullshitting. You know, she's a New Yorker. She doesn't like bullshit. I think she she liked the idea. She knew she could help from like a branding standpoint. I think that's it. I mean, and I think she's in love with me too. So there's there's also that. Yeah, yeah, she wants you. Yeah, totally, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. And she, I, I mean, and she's still involved in the business. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, we, she's as involved as we want her to after be. After you guys closed, how quickly did it actually materialize? After, or was it was it quick? Because usually sometimes quick. the DD process. Ours was quick. Yeah. But we had everything dialed in. And then was she more interested? Was she like, okay, cool, like I see the levers here. Let's do X, Y, Z. Let's open up a storefront. No, she was more, She again, she was more, she's more like following our beat. Okay. So she was like, well, um, what do you guys want to do? We, we want another truck. Get another truck. Yeah. We got two trucks. We got three trucks. We got four trucks. And that's when she was like, you guys need to franchise. And I was like, what's franchise? I, right. Literally, that was what does my, that mean? What is franchise? When, how quickly after you go on, like how many trucks do you guys have out there when the show airs? Two, maybe we just got the second one, maybe. Right and what, tell me what happens then. Oh, bro, it was just, it, it was already ridiculous. Yeah, was it was say. already insane and it just doubled. We doubled our sales, everything doubled. But we, but we were already like, everywhere we went was like mile long lines. And you always considered that the food trucks are so great because they're quick. They're, yeah. they're affordable. Correct. The startup costs aren't that high. You can rent them out if you if you want to. And so there's like it's a lower risk option. At what point do you guys start thinking let let's go to a storefront? Pretty soon. Okay. And it was a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, the first one we went to is we went and did like a pop up somewhere where we did like a shared space, and it was a nightmare because it was a co branded space, and we didn't realize how important individual branding and you know that whole vibe was. We we're like, oh shit, we'll serve it in this bar. It's great. We have our logo on the menu. Boom. But people were confused. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're like, I don't get it. I thought yeah. I was coming to your place, not a bar. Like, what is this? Right. So that was a big time suck and a big lesson. And Barbara told us not to do it. Most of the times we don't listen to her, truthfully. We're like, no, no, we know what we're doing. You know, so like that was a big lesson. And, and it kind of taught us like you got to stay in your lane and do do what you do. Okay. We eventually opened a location here on Santa Monica in West Hollywood. We were, we were there for about eight years and we did it right ourselves. Near the, the Trader Joe's over there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I used to go there at night for uh, lobster bisque. There you go. This is years ago. Cool, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. like we lived in West Hollywood also. What didn't you like about the retail environment in that setting, in like the brick and mortar? I didn't like it. I was enamored with it. Like okay. I thought it was awesome. And everyone wants to say they own a restaurant, but that's like ego. That's true. Right? Everyone's ego is like, a I, own a, I own a place. I own a restaurant, not a food truck. I own a restaurant. You know, it's like it's so much more sexy. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, is like it's way more risky. It doesn't necessarily make more money. It depends on the location. Like we have some in our system that crank. But for the most part, our food trucks are the breadwinners. Yeah. They do massive sales. And you can go to the market and you can serve and make tons of dough and leave and go home. Yeah. It's that simple. You, d you don't have to pay rent and be stuck in a single location. Our food also, I, in my opinion. It's, flex it's the flexibility of yeah. the truck that wins. Yeah, it's, it's flexibility. It's the ability to like go serve different people, to always be mobile, to not always be on. And I think like depending on your food, our food doesn't necessarily do well when oversaturated. Yeah. Lobster isn't an everyday food. It's not an every, every week food. Right. You know, so depending on your neighborhood, unless you have tons of turnover and uh, tons of tourists, yeah. you know, people get tired of it. That's true. It's not, and it's also not as, as exciting. When we come and we bring our food truck, it's exciting. It's, it's exciting. Oh, they're here. They're here. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. And then when yeah. we take it away, you're like, damn, Where are they when are they coming today? back? Right, right. Not for two weeks. Damn. How long did it take you to figure out the franchise model? Like, <laughs> we're still figuring it out. Yeah. yeah it's hard. Yeah. I mean, we're about eight years in or seven years in seven, eight years, we, it took us a good, I don't know, four or five years before, you know, when I say figure it out, it means like being comfortable with your rules and what you stand for. That's, I mean, we figured it out right away because we, but you don't know what you don't know. You don't know if your ideas are right. You don't know if like your vision is going to work. Right. And that was our big trepidation. We're like, man, we know we do well in LA, but when we open in Raleigh, North Carolina, how the fuck, how are we going to do there? Yeah, exactly. And how do we, how do we make these people money? And how do you empower them? And how do we empower, how do yeah. we, how do we make them buy in? How do we make them care? Yeah, they just want to so make hard. money. Yeah. And so when you guys do that, what do you offer? What do you provide? What is the franchisee doing? 
We provide an amazing support system, okay. training. Uh, we train in Maine. We bring them on boats. They catch lobsters before they open. Oh, uh, wow. They come. Uh, we do on, on training here in Los Angeles. We go to their location. We do training there. Our team is amazing. Our staff is amazing. They're always supportive. Everything. I mean, you can name any aspect of the business. We have a staff member that's, like, dedicated and ready to help. And we care, right? Like, we had thousands of leads initially for franchises, and we sold 10 because we wanted to figure out what we were doing before we like made money and we've never made moves for money that's the one thing we never have done we've never like sold out to make more money and we've never like made this decision for money ever and by doing that we've always made more money yeah, you know because i think when secret. people cut yeah when yeah. people cut corners and they're like yo if passion. i do this i'll make some more cash you will in the beginning but not in the end yeah it doesn't work have you ever thought about branching out? Like, we're, we're the businesses today. Do you does anything get you going on like branching out to different food topics or different food trucks? Because to some extent, you you figured out a lot, right? Yeah. You figured out food trucks work. Obviously, the lobsters work. But is there another food item that you're passionate about? You know what I'm saying? Like, because you, yeah. you know the game now from yeah. a different lens. Yeah. Right. Before it was like I just want to get lobster in the in the hands of so many. Now the game is like I've actually created this business yeah. where I know the levers for growth. And can we just swap out? Maybe it's not lobster. Maybe it's something else. Yeah. Truthfully, for me, no. The reason why is I just know how hard the business is. Yeah. And I feel like we hit a good spot, and I don't think I'm good enough or knowledgeable enough to <laughs> hit another spot like to that. To do more. I, I mean, I think about it. Like yeah. With my buddies, we're always like, yo, let's open a pizza place. You know, let's open yeah, burgers. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like, because I love that kind of food. But I'm comfortable staying in my lane, being the best. I think I'm the best. I think we are the best. Staying in our lane and getting better. And still learning. There's so much to learn in a business, right? So I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I mean, of course... We flirt with the ideas all the time, but we're branching out. You know, we have an e-commerce business. You guys make lobster quesadillas now, too. Yeah, we have. Yeah. yeah. So, so there you go. We have a little yeah, bit of some, a, some diversity. Say, yeah. I was just at a, a birthday party. A friend of mine, she was the former CEO of uh, IMAX. Yeah. And so she, she, had, she had a truck. She had ours? Birthday, yeah. Oh, cool. Hell yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's an East Coaster also. So oh, obviously. Yeah. yeah. She's from, she's from that's Long the, Island. That, that's the, in Long Island? Yeah. But then she, she went the she lived in Boston for a little while. That's the coolest thing is like finding all these East Coast transplants that are out here or people that just like our food. Like, you know, we've, we've done a lot of cool people and it's, 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 a, it's always, I mean, it makes us feel good. I believe because it, yeah. our food is a nostalgic taste. It's a very much like a taste of home. Yeah. So when people like it and they get that feeling, it makes you feel, makes you feel good. During COVID for me personally, it was, uh, so I grew up in Massachusetts. My wife's from the Cape yep. also. And so we would eat lobster rolls during yep. COVID. And it was like a thing of like a reminder of oh, home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a real nostalgia to that. And I don't think people really understood it because it's like we couldn't fly home. We couldn't yeah. or we could, but it, it would just be annoying or there yeah. was all these risks. And so yeah. it was just like driving to a place to have a lobster roll was, was the moment. And it was really special. It was really cool. It was uh, celebratory. Point. Yeah. It was, we, and like freeing during COVID. It 100%. was like, that's the thing. It was like we felt free. It was weird. We did well with COVID for that. I mean, for the A, because we could still serve. You know, but but B, because people wanted a reason to be happy and they wanted to uh, they wanted to feel like they could still treat themselves to something just like what you're describing. Yeah. And that's that's our food. Yeah. Where's the business today? Business is cranking. Um, we've got about 50 food trucks, 10 restaurants, something along those lines. We have a good amount in queue. Very happy franchisees, happy corporate staff. We're growing. You know, we're in a growth mode right now where we're... Uh, Did you guys raise capital after no, Shark Tank? Mm -mm, no. No. Okay. No. Any plan? How big do you want to grow this? Do you want to sell this one day? I don't know. Is it already beyond your wild? If you go back to oh. like the conversation of you and, and Jimmy Bro. at the bar, yeah. is it already just the, the craziest story? It, of course. It, I mean, it was crazy with one truck that was wild, you know, and then... and. Where we are now is un unheard of for, for us because we didn't, I did, we didn't even know it existed, these opportunities. You know, I think nowadays for kids, young adults that watch Shark Tank, this is just a different day and age. I'm 42. When I was in school, people didn't talk about owning your own business. Yeah. People didn't say you could do this. I had no clue, you know, personally that you could do things like this. So I had no knowledge of what my expectations could be or should be. So when, as it's unfolded, and as we went from this to this, to this, to this milestone, to that milestone, to where it is right now, it's, it's unfathomable for us because I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. It's a, you know, so. That's yeah. something we, when we talked to Mindy, it was the same thing. She was talking about when the, when the show first came about, entrepreneurship was still like a dirty word to some extent. Like you had to be kind of crazy. You know, everyone was on the nine, nine, nine to five, which makes sense logically, right? It's like mm -hmm. a safe thing to do. And mm -hmm. so for you to go out on your own. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And then for the show to do so well, and she was saying how like today you can go to school, major in entrepreneurship. Yeah. And so the world has changed 
and it's almost like a safer space. Um, still hard, but still safer. We do stuff all the time for kids. Like a teacher will reach out to us and be like, hey, my class is doing a thing on Shark Tank and they want to present their pitches. Would you be interested in judging? You know, if there were oh, a fifth fun. grade class in, in Michigan. We're like, yeah, let's do it. You know, so we'll, we'll Zoom with the class. Yeah. But we get it all the time. So they're starting at that age, yeah. you know, which is cool. So, is cool. I mean, I think like we're opening children's minds up and and it's not only about making money most most of the time they're like hey i want to do this because it's it's important to me you know i want to get fresh water to africa i want to do these type and you're like dude these kids are thinking like that you know when i was in sixth grade I'm like, well, what was i thinking about so it's really impressive that's true let me ask you some dumb questions will, will the world ever run out of lobster no <laughs> okay it's no. impossible no we, I mean, not Maine lobster. What about fishermen? Is that the hard part? What's the hard part of like the supply? Well, we're, we are a sustainable lobster fishery in Maine. So, you know, there's measures in place so that doesn't happen. So you don't overfish. Yeah. And other areas, you know, yeah, you might. Okay. Um, the hard part for us, the most important part is just maintaining consistency. So we would never sacrifice quantity sacrifice quality for quantity yeah, ever. So, you know, this isn't a trinket. It's not, a, we always say it's not a mass produced burger or a toy or something that you can just order 10 more million of. So right. there isn't, there's a limit. There's a limit for us. There's a limit for everyone. I don't know what that is. Yeah. And we're not necessarily trying to, you know, make this uh, everyday mom and pop or everyday like McDonald's or something. Sure. Has that ever been like, I'm sure you've gotten an email or two about, about that concept though. What? About somebody saying, hey, we should do this like McDonald's. Yeah, we could email. So yeah, we could create all kinds of stuff. Does your mind ever go, well, maybe? No. I mean, in the beginning, we used to entertain stuff like this because, again, we didn't know any better. Yeah. So you'd be more apt to just, like, try shit because you'd, you're like, all right, whatever. Yeah, let's go. What do you think? Yeah. And, again, ego. Our egos, especially as young men, it's exciting to hear things like this. Yeah. It's exciting to be like, oh, we could be in a pop-up restaurant. It's ex those things are exciting. Yeah. But now we're not... You know, we're older, we've, we've been through the trenches, and our egos are, we've been humbled. I mean, more than anything, we've been humbled. That's honest. When I started my first company, people were like, oh, why'd you start it? And I'm like, because I went to school for civil engineering, and when I'm in Boston at a bar telling a girl I went to school for civil engineering, she doesn't care. Yeah. The conversation's over. Yeah. But if I tell her I have this company, and yeah. this is what I do, yeah. she's willing to talk to me for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's it. That's why I started the company. Okay. Right? Which I think is honest. Like, it's like... We're at the end of the day, men, we're trying to, you know, procreate and whatever. Hell and yeah. so like, and it's true. And that's what kind of got me into entrepreneurship, I think. And then I saw it and I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I just fell in love with the business and the thing, the thing we were talking about earlier, like living over your skis is like an addiction to me now. And now we're just trying to, trying to crank. What's on deck? Anything new? Any, anything you're releasing? Anything you're working on? What's on deck for us? I mean, we have just more units opening, new cities. We just brought on a new person um, for growth specifically, okay. which is the first time we've ever done it. Like we've, a COO or like what's no, the role? No, for uh, franchise sales. Okay. We've never done that. Most of our leads and calls have been, I'd say, 95% inbound okay. or internal growth. So someone saw our truck and they called or our current franchisee wants to grow somewhere else. Okay. We just brought someone in actually to actually procure more leads into target specific markets. And if someone wants to do that, what's the cost? Can you give people like a window into what's the process? Is there an application process? What's the cost? Yeah, they have to go online. They submit something. The franchise fee is 38,500, um, but there's there's other costs associated, like you know whether you want to buy a, a truck or a restaurant, there's build out costs associated with that. You know, our trucks right now are around $250,000. Oh, wow. They're sexy. They're really nice. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, they're amazing. What we do, I just think, is incredibly special. It, we, we really, really do something special. Do you have a favorite location or like a, a destination you want to be in? We've talked about Maui. We've talked about Maui. but um, And that's just because I like to surf. And I love Maui. But um, I don't know, man. Like, you know, I'm surprised, truthfully, like, if I told you, like, our best regions, there some of them are just these small elbow cities. You know, we do well in Oklahoma City. We do really well in Columbus. We do really well in Pittsburgh. Why do you it, think that is? Are you finding, like, the East Coasters in Oklahoma City? I just think it's because we're bringing something somewhere that they've never had. And it's not accessible and it didn't exist. Kind of like what happened here in L.A. It just wasn't there. Right. So, like, we're bringing something and, and I th also think there's an, uh, an amount of appreciation from people in those areas. They're like, hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for, we'll drive, and I say Columbus, so let's say we're in Columbus. We'll drive an hour, hour and a half out of Columbus, in the middle of nowhere, like nowhere. But we'll advertise on Facebook, tell people we're going there to so-and-so's wine shop or bike, bike shop or whatever. And we'll show up and, you know, they'll do 20 grand in sales. And 
the people there are like, dude, thank you so much for coming. You know, this is awesome. This is ex exciting. It's a treat. This is cool. And our franchisee stoked because, you know, he just made tons of money. That's really, really cool. And we're excited because we're in a market servicing areas that we never would have gone to. Again, think of a brick and mortar. You can't pick them up and leave. Right. You would it's have never flexible. left downtown Columbus work. to go out there. Right. So it's cool. I just love the feeling of it that you're talking about. Like, I really believe it. You know, it's like you're giving somebody a window into something so special. hundred percent. And that just happens to be a business for you. Which is epic. I mean, that's that's such a good. It's amazing. That's rare. You know what I mean. And it and wasn't. So cool. It wasn't planned, and it wasn't. We had no idea. So as we've unfo as the business has unfolded, we've realized just that just what you're describing. But we didn't. We we're not smart enough to know that. Like we were like, fuck, let's just do this. And we had no clue if people, how many people out here were from the East Coast, or how many people felt the same way that we do about lobster, or felt the same way that we do about family and all those things. So like when you're talking about your 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 bites, there's it's not just food. It's like our food has like family and taste and summertime and you know beach and salty air like all that stuff is wrapped into that oh, and man. you and you kind of like you know or you went to school there and you had you know, went to college and you remember all these things about college and whatever you know or you we have people oh, we used to go to camp up there and we drop our kids off and we get and like that's fucking cool so yeah. they remember their kids yeah but it's not like a burger everyone fucking needs burgers yeah that's the difference i really love that how's the relationship today with barbara amazing yeah, yeah. still yeah oh, you're not yeah. married to her though not yet well, my wife doesn't know. Yeah, <laughs> now we, um, she, she's like family. You yeah. know, we're 10, 11 years in, right? She's family to us. So we, we talk to her mostly about personal stuff, not even really about business stuff. You know, yeah. we text her, she'll text back about silly shit. Well, we go to New York, we hang out, we go to her house, eat dinner, stay there. Like it's not, it's much more now about personal life than business. Yeah. She's the real deal. They all are. They all are all the real deal. We've met them all. Damon was the first person in line at our restaurant the night that it opened, and we had no clue. I, I thought still that was at, so cool, by the way, that they all showed up for you. I was still in the shower. My cousin called. He's like, yo, Damon's here. I was like, dude, come on. <laughs> I was like, seriously, get down here. That's amazing. Cousin's Lobster. Go check it out. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Thank brother. you for having me. I appreciate, appreciate you it. sharing the story. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.